Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video on selective breeding and genetic engineering. Now, before you watch this video, make sure that you are confident on the basic structures of animal and plant cells, um, the structure of DNA, the previous uh, lesson on genetics and also um, evolution as well. Now, in this video, we are just going to look at two things, but in quite a lot of detail. Those two things are selective breeding and genetic engineering. OK, so let's start by looking at selective breeding. Now, selective breeding is a technique used by farmers to improve the characteristics of their crops and livestock by choosing which individuals uh, can breed. Now, an example of that is, is this. So you have probably at some point in your life eaten cabbage. Um, or maybe some broccoli, or perhaps some cauliflower, or maybe some kale. Now, all of those four different vegetables may seem very, very different, but actually they've all come from the same wild plant called wild mustard. Um, and that wild mustard has been shaped over many generations of selective breeding into each of these four very different vegetables. And there are others that have come from that as well. You know, For example, Brussels sprouts is another example um, of a vegetable that's come from this same wild mustard plant. Now, we do selective breeding in order to improve the characteristics uh, to make them more desirable. But what do we mean by more desirable? And you, you do need to be specific about this in an exam, depending on the context of a question. So it might be about having a greater yield. That means growing more food from the same plant. Um, it might be about growing faster or maybe being resistant to a disease so that the, um, so the plants don't die before you can harvest them. It might be about making them more nutritious, um, having a better flavour. It could be about being drought resistant so the plants can grow with less water. And um, particularly when we're, we're, we're um, selectively breeding animals, it might be about improving their temperament, you know, making a, a, a dog less aggressive or something like that. Now, this is a technique that has been performed by farmers for thousands of years. And in fact, nearly all of the food you eat is the result of selective breeding. Pretty much the only food we eat that hasn't come from selective breeding is seafood that's been caught in the wild rather than farmed. But beyond that, just about all the food you ever eat has come as a result of this selective breeding process. So it's super important. OK, so let's look at the method for how selective breeding works. Now, the first thing we do, the first step is to select the individuals with the most desirable characteristics. Now, what we mean by most desirable, it really varies depending on what it is we're trying to achieve. You know, as we saw on the last slide, maybe we're trying to improve the yield. Maybe we're trying to make something tastier. Maybe we're trying to make it grow faster, whatever that might be. In this example, though, we're going to be looking to try and produce some spotty dogs from a uh, from an initial generation of dogs that are quite unspotty. So our most desirable characteristic in this case is about being the spottiest. Now we can see there's a range of spottiness here from completely unspotty to fairly spotty. Our two spottiest dogs are this one and this one. So what we'll do is we will select those and they are the ones that, they, that we will allow to breed together. So we will breed them together to produce some offspring. And our offspring might look like this. And so, importantly, the reason why the spotty dogs were spotty was because they had the genes for spottiness. And when they breed together, they're going to pass those spottiness genes onto their offspring. But some of them might get even more of those spottiness genes. And so, although they're all fairly spotty, we've got some that have got, you know, they're pretty unspotty. We don't want to really breed that one, but we do definitely want to breed this guy here and this one here because they are, are our spottiest ones. So from the offspring, we select again the ones that have got the most desirable characteristics and we breed them together. And that produces a third generation. And again, we can see we've got some variation in spottiness. They're not all equally spotty, but some are definitely more spotty than others. And in this case, it is um, these two here. And so we're going to breed them and the general idea is that we just repeat this process for many generations and getting gradually more spotty, hopefully, with each generation. And if we do this for about 20 generations or so, we end up producing what we call a new variety 
or a new breed. Now, really important, these are not a new species. These really spotty guys can still breed with these completely unspotty guys because they're, they're still dogs, they're just a different variety of dog. And this is the general uh, sort of way uh, how all selective breeding works. We just select the ones with the best characteristics, breed them together, raise the offspring, select the offspring with the best characteristics, and just repeat that process again and again and again until we end up producing a new variety or breed that is significantly different to what we started with. So what are the kind of pros and cons of selective breeding? Now, in terms of the pros, selective breeding can produce a wide range of desirable characteristics. And we've got a lot to thank selective breeding for. As I said earlier, virtually all the food that we eat has come from this process. Um, Importantly, it can be done without sophisticated technology. This isn't something that is done by scientists in a lab, but it's done by farmers working on their farms as part of their, their kind of daily business. And farmers have been doing this process for literally thousands of years without any technology whatsoever. Um, also, uh, selective breeding can improve the profitability of farming. Um, by allowing them to produce crops and livestock that are either more valuable, so they can sell them for more, for more money, or cheaper to produce, or both. However, there are some downsides as well, and those downsides are important to think about. The first thing is that selective breeding is slow. It can take literally decades to produce a new variety. Um, additionally, there is no guarantee that you can achieve the effect you want. Um, you know, there, there is a limit because, it, you know, if the genes for that particular characteristic just aren't present in that plant, then no amount of selective breeding is going to create those genes. And also what we see is reduced genetic variation due to inbreeding. Selective breeding necessarily results in animals and plants that are more closely related, breeding with each other, and then that increases the chance of harmful recessive genes coming together leading to genetic illnesses and on a similar kind of note we often see physical problems caused by extreme selection so for example the uh, the gene that leads to increased spottiness in dalmatians um, also is linked to other genes that cause deafness so a significant number of dalmatians are deaf as a result of their selection um, with bulldogs now, if we look at the shape of a bulldog skull here, you know, that cute face of a bulldog actually comes because their skull is really misshaped. Uh, and you can well imagine um, how that might lead to the breathing problems that we often see in bulldogs because their skull has actually been selected by us, ending up producing an unhealthy uh, structure that is no good for the animal. Now, our second technique for improving the characteristics of the animals and plants that farmers farm is called genetic engineering. Now, genetic engineering is about producing desirable characteristics in one organism by introducing genes from another organism entirely. So this is something that can never happen naturally in the wild, but we can do this now because we've got this uh, incredible technology. And this leads to the production of what we call genetically modified organisms, or simply GMOs for short. So a GMO is an organism with genes that have been altered by this process of genetic engineering. And some examples of this, um, a number of you listening will have type 1 diabetes. And if you've got type, type 1 diabetes, you will uh, have to inject insulin um, at regular points throughout the day. And that insulin is actually produced by genetic engineering. So what's happened is the human insulin gene has been introduced into bacteria. So now those bacteria can make the human insulin and we can then uh, collect it and um, provide it to people with type 1 diabetes to inject as part of their treatment. Another example um, is that there is a gene for a, um, a substance called beta carotene um, has been introduced into rice plants to make what we call golden rice and that has greater nutritional value than regular rice. So um, here is what regular rice looks like. That orangey looking stuff, that is the golden rice genetically engineered that has um, greater nutritional value and can ho hopefully improve the diets of some of the poor farmers um, who, uh, who, who depend on it. And the last example we've got is the example of introducing the gene 
for an insect killing chemical that is naturally found in some bacteria and that gets introduced into crop plants that are grown on farms so that the um, crops as they grow they produce chemicals that will kill the insects that um, might try to eat them. We can see an example of that there. Um, this is often called Bt corn. Um, that Bt standing for Bacillus thuringiensis which is the um, bacteria that this harmful chemical has been taken from and this Bt corn is grown quite widely in some countries and it, it, it you know it significantly reduces how much pesticide they need to use to grow their crops. So let's look at the pros and cons of genetic engineering. Now in terms of pros the first one is that you can create organisms that would simply not be possible by selective breeding. You know, no amount of selective breeding could ever produce bacteria that make human insulin. No amount of selective breeding could um, produce rice that um, makes beta carotene. So it lets you do things that there is simply no other way to achieve. Um, and sort of related to that is that you're highly likely to introduce the desired characteristics provided they're controlled by a single gene. You know, with selective breeding, there's an element of luck uh, in there. You know, there might be things you want to achieve that simply aren't possible, but provided they're controlled by a single gene, then that is possible with genetic engineering. Why we're talking about a single gene is because there are limitations. You know, you couldn't, for example, genetically engineer humans to have wings because birds' wings um, aren't produced by one single wing gene, but by the interactions of, of, of thousands of genes all working together uh, in different ways. Now, um, in terms of their cons, con number one is that this is expensive and technically challenging to do. You know, genetic engineering now for scientists working in labs is a fairly routine process, but it still requires significant amounts of technical knowledge, technical equipment, all sorts of different um, specialised chemicals and um, other bits and pieces to do. And that's not something that a farmer or someone like that would have access to. Um, there are some concerns about potential health risks um, of GM crops, although there is simply no evidence to support this. There have been all sorts of, you know, kind of um, sensationalised um, news stories about people ripping up fields of crops because of GM crops because they're worried about the health risks. But actually, as far as I'm aware, there are no significant health risks. Um, and there are ethical issues uh, as well. So some people believe that it is simply unnatural or in some way wrong to introduce genes from one organism into another. And there are some ethical issues as well around some types of GM technology. So some seed companies have introduced uh, GM technology to prevent farmers from collecting the seed from their crops one year to then sow again the next year. Um, and that then means that the farmers have to keep on buying the, sa the seed again and again uh, from the company rather than saving it for themselves. And there are eth ethical issues around that, but that's, that's more an ethical issue with the way the technology is being applied rather than the actual basic idea uh, of, of, uh, of whether it's right or wrong. Now, we're going to look at the higher tier side of the genetic engineering. And so we, we're going to look on the next slide at the process behind how genetic engineering works. But before we do that, we're going to meet some language that is going to feature on that next slide. So the first bit of language we're going to meet um, is the idea of the sticky end. Now, a sticky end is a short sequence of unpaired bases at the end of a piece of DNA. And you can see that here. So that there and that there, those are two sticky ends on that piece of DNA. Those unpaired AATT and TTAA on each end. That is a sticky end. Okay. Now, a restriction enzyme is an enzyme that cuts DNA at specific points. Okay, so it cuts the DNA at specific points, leaving those sticky ends. And we can see that here. So if we look at our piece of DNA, the yellow is supposed to represent a gene. You see a gene there, gene there, gene there. Not realistic, by the way. Genes are much, much, much longer than that, but then I wouldn't be able to fit it on the slide. So, um, But the yellow bits represent our genes, and the blue section represents where the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA and you can see how the DNA is being cut like that to leave the sticky end there and the sticky end there. Um, so now that one piece of DNA is two pieces uh, both with those sticky ends. 
So that's restriction enzymes. They cut the DNA. We've also got ligase enzymes. And what ligase enzymes do is they join two pieces of DNA by their sticky ends. So if we if we um, start with our big piece of DNA here, a restriction enzyme will cut it into two pieces, leaving the sticky ends. And the ligase enzyme will join the two pieces together into one, again, by their sticky ends. The last thing we need to talk about is the idea of a vector. Now, we've met that word vector um, in the context of um, communicable diseases and, and how animals animal vectors can transfer diseases into humans. But this word vector in general in this context is about transferring something from one place to another. So in the context of genetic engineering, a vector is a DNA molecule that is modified and used to transport a new gene into a cell. So we can see that here. So um, that there, for example, that is our vector. Okay. In this case, it is one of those small loops of DNA that bacteria have called plasmids, okay? Um, and you can see that yellow section, that represents our modified gene that's been introduced into the plasmid, and then the plasmids put back into the bacteria, and so that is how the plasmid can function as a vector. So that's some of the language you need, sticky ends, restriction enzymes, ligase enzymes, and vectors. And so what we'll do now is we'll look at the detailed process um, of how genetic engineering works. Okay, so let's look now at the detail of genetic engineering. And the example we're going to work with is the example of engineering bacteria to produce the human insulin that can be used to treat type 1 diabetes. Now, our first step is to remove uh, the DNA from a human cell. And we can see that here. So we can see how the DNA will be naturally found in the nucleus. And now we've got the double helix here. Um, showing that DNA. Now, the next step is to identify in the human DNA the insulin gene itself. Now, that's not straightforward. That's not something you just do. That takes many months of work to figure out where the gene is, but we can do it. Um, just worth noting, I'm always going to, in my diagram, the, it, the gene itself is going to be yellow. So here we can see that yellow section. That is the gene. Then what we do is we use our restriction enzymes to cut the insulin gene out of the DNA, leaving those sticky ends. So again, our yellow here, that is the gene, and these circled sections there, those are our sticky ends. Now we're going to look at the bacteria. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get our bacteria that we want to engineer and remove some plasmids from the bacteria and they're going to be our vector. Remember, the vector is how we transfer the gene into the organism. So here is our plasmid. Now, much as the um, much as the gene I've drawn in yellow, the plasmid I've always drawn in blue. So that blue ring there, that is our plasmid. And what we need to do now, before we can insert the gene into the plasmid, is we need to open that plasmid up. So we cut the plasmid open using those restriction enzymes again and again leaving those sticky ends so this this blue section here that is still our plasmid but now it's been opened up by the restriction enzymes leaving those sticky ends like that and what that allows us to do now is to join the plasmid and the gene via their sticky ends using the ligase enzymes so again the blue section there is the DNA from the plasmid, and the yellow section here is the DNA um, from our gene. And you can see how they've been joined together. And once you've joined them together, we now call that a recombinant plasmid. Recombinant means something they've been recombined, they've been joined together. And so our final step now, now that we've got this plasmid with our human insulin gene, is simply to insert the recombinant plasmid back into the bacteria and now that bacteria has the gene to produce human insulin and we can grow it um, and culture it and collect the insulin from it and use it to treat the type 1 diabetes and really importantly now that this bacteria has got the human insulin genes whenever it divides and reproduces 
the daughter cells of that process will also contain that human insulin gene, as will their daughter cells when they reproduce and so on. So although this process is difficult and expensive, you only need to do it once because, all the, be, be, because the fact that you've altered the DNA means that all of the offspring will contain those modified genes as well. Okay, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.